All right, coming to you live from Champion Studio in beautiful Charleston, South Carolina. And it is a gorgeous day today after what feels like seven, eight straight days of just endless rain. A beautiful day in Charleston, South Carolina. It is better than ever live. Wherever you're watching, wherever you're listening, I hope you're making today, like every day, your masterpiece. My name is Dr. David Geyer. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, and media medical expert. I help you feel and perform your best regardless of age, injury, or medical conditions. We have a lot to talk about today. We're going to get, it's mostly on one overarching thing, but a lot of subtopics. We're going to do a little bit about prostate cancer because September is National Prostate Cancer Awareness Month for all you men out there. And then we're going to do the rest of the show. We're going to talk about exercise. We're going to talk about how much exercise you actually need to live longer or at least not drop dead early. We're going to talk about the best time of day to exercise. Is it mornings? Is it afternoons? Is it nights? We're going to talk about pregnancy and problem pregnancies, complicated pregnancies, and whether exercise is good during complicated pregnancies. We're going to talk about exercise and its role on obesity genes. Yes, there are genes that influence obesity and exercise might play a role in that. We're going to talk about low intensity activity, things like cooking, cleaning, doing yard work. Does that actually count as exercise and does that help your health? And then my one that I'm most interested in is this idea and study. We're gonna, there's actually research behind this about whether you, whether I, can run a 10K race, which is 6.2 miles, with absolutely no training. We're not going to talk about should you do that. We're going to talk about could you do that? A whole lot of interesting things to get there. A um, lot of good stuff uh, to talk about. Remember, if you have comments, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I'd love it if you'd share your first name and where you are, city, state, or country, something like that, so that I can share that on the screen if possible. If you have comments about this, certainly post those about anything we talk about or any questions. And if we have a little bit of time at the end, I will try to address some of that. All right, let's start with prostate cancer. Now, this may seem like not a big deal because when you think of heart disease and you think of breast cancer and uh, you know deaths from accidents and suicides and things like that are at the, that are at the top of the list, prostate cancer doesn't seem so bad. And, and for a lot of men, it's treatable. But still, 200,000 men each year are newly diagnosed with prostate cancer in this country. So it is a big deal. That's why I mentioned September is National Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Well, there's a new study that just came out in the British Journal of Nutrition looking at tea, basically men who drank tea. And what they figured out, and it's interesting, they followed over 25,000 men uh, over a period of about 11 and a half years. And over those 11 and a half years, over 3,000 of the men were diagnosed with prostate cancer. So then they compared the ones who had prostate cancer, the ones who didn't. And what they found, this is really interesting, drinking tea, at least among men who normally drank tea, the men who drank the highest amounts of tea had a significantly lower risk of developing prostate cancer than the men who drank the least amount of tea. So really, really interesting. Now, what they couldn't figure out, and the study wasn't really designed as a, as a trial, meaning you put people in different groups and then see what happens. So they can't say that the men that just don't normally drink any tea, if they started now, would they have a lower risk of prostate cancer? But at least it does seem to show pretty good evidence that it might influence your risk of prostate cancer. So men, if you're out there, if you drink tea anyway, you know, green tea or, or whatever, you know, preferably not sweet tea with tons and tons of sugar, but other kinds of teas, it might lower your risk of prostate cancer. But I mentioned it's National Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. So all you men out there, but if you're 55 years old or older, you need to be seeing your doctor on a regular basis to get screened for prostate cancer. If you have a family member who's had prostate cancer, you probably should start doing that even earlier. All right, let's talk about exercise. I love to exercise. I'm on a, now a regimen where I'm exercising twice a day, cardio in the mornings, weights in the afternoon. Absolutely love it. I love exercise. 
really since not just playing sports as a kid, but when I stopped playing, especially travel soccer and, and switched to exercise, I started to love being in the weight room and at the time started loving running. But let's be fair, it's not for everybody. Now, one of the good things about exercise that we've always known is that exercise helps you live longer or at least lowers the chance that you're going to drop dead in your 40s or 50s. There was a study, a CDC study, 2018, that basically found that 10% of deaths in adults between the ages of 40 and 70 were caused by not enough exercise. 10% of all the deaths in that age group. In Europe, a 2019 study found that basically if you're inactive for two decades, so you know that could be high school, you know, 14 all the way up to 34, you go high school, college, and then you have a desk job, you don't do much exercise, or maybe it's 30 to 50. Basically, two decades of not exercising very much doubles your risk of dying early. So these are certainly important. So two new studies came out that look at, uh, sort of address the idea of how much exercise do you need to live longer or not die earlier? One of them I talked about on a TV segment. I do a daily TV segment on the ABC and Fox channels uh, here in Charleston, South Carolina, and I did a segment on one of these studies. It was a study in the JAMA Network Open, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it looked at how many steps you need on a daily basis. We have all, all heard 10,000 steps. But you might be surprised to know there's very little data to support 10,000 steps. It's not that it's, it's not a bad number, but should that be the benchmark? Is that too high? Is it high enough? So there are a bunch of researchers that questioned that, University of Massachusetts and other institutions that thought, hey, no, 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 it's probably a lot lower than that. So what they did is they looked at people, how many were in this? Over 2,000 people, and they, they were in another health study um, that started 10 years earlier, and they got those people's records. They found out that of those 2,100 people, 72 died in those 10 years, and they looked at what was different between the 72 that had died and the other um, 2,000, and these were people in their 40s, so if they died in those 10 years, it would be obviously considered an early death. Well, what they found out, here's sort of an interesting threshold. The men and women in the study who, who took at least 7,000 steps a day were 50% less likely to have died in the 10 years uh, during that study compared to the, pe the people who didn't get 10,000 steps a day. Now, as you might expect, if you did more than that, your mortality risk or your chance of dying early kept dropping. At 9,000 steps a day, you, you'd cut your mortality risk by 70%. But here's what's interesting. At 10,000 steps, those benefits leveled off. You didn't get any extra benefit in terms of living longer by going over 10,000 steps. Almost nobody that went regularly past 10,000 steps a day actually lived or were less likely to die than the people at 7,000 steps. So all you really seem to need 7,000, maybe 8,000, maybe 9,000 steps a day, which isn't hard to get if you're just not sitting all day long. And then the other study I haven't talked about on TV, but it's really interesting, similar, but didn't look at steps. It was from the Mayo Clinic proceedings published in August, and they looked at exercise more than steps. And what they found was that people who got between and this was a study of almost 9,000 Danish people uh, over a 25-year period of time. And the people who got somewhere between 2.6 hours of exercise per week and 4.5 hours of exercise per week, they were 40% less likely to have died in those 25 years of the study. Not all that surprising. That's roughly, what is that, 30 to 45 minutes a day most days. But here's the thing. When you got to that four and a half hours a week, all of a sudden the benefits again plateaued. And here's the thing, you know, we all know people who just love to exercise just huge amounts. Well, in this study, the people that went to 10 hours of exercise a week, which is roughly you know, 90 minutes a day or something like that, maybe, yeah, about 90 minutes a day, 10 hours of exercise a week, you actually lost the benefits of the mortality. You actually, your risk of early death went back up a little bit. So there is clearly a point where you're actually going the wrong direction. Here's the bottom line of both of these studies. One, 
you don't need as much exercise as we thought. You know, seven, 8,000 steps a day should lower your risk of dropping dead early. 30 to 45 minutes a day is all you need. Doesn't really matter what the exercise is. And there isn't a right way to do it. It can be walking and taking steps. It can be exercise and whatever type of exercise is fun. You're doing a little bit more than 30 to 45 minutes of exercise a day may give you a little bit of extra benefits in terms of living longer, but there certainly could be a point where you might be overdoing it. All right, let's talk about the best time of exercise or the best time of day to exercise. And I'm gonna disappoint you a little bit here that this really only applies to a small group of people. This is not necessarily true with everybody, but here's the thing. Your circadian clock, basically your biologic rhythms throughout the day and when your body is revved up and when it slows down and when you feel tired and all that, that's sort of controlled. That's its own internal clock. But your metabolism is also well linked to it. So in this journal uh, article that was in uh, this study in physiological reports, these researchers, and I, I'm pretty sure this is a Dutch study, they looked specifically at men and men that were basically what they called metabolic health uh, or metabolic and compromised. Basically men largely with obesity who had type two diabetes. So yes, this is specifically for them, but what they did is they put 32 of them into 12 weeks of supervised uh, training with a, a trainer but half the group did it from eight to 10 in the morning, half did it from three to six in the afternoon. And compared to the ones in the morning, the overweight type two diabetes males were much more likely to have a better response metabolically, better uh, insulin sensitivity, and it has it pertains to storage of fat and things like that. So from a metabolic standpoint, if you're obese, if you have type two diabetes, definitely consider exercising in the afternoon. Now, this we don't know if this applies to all men, men that aren't obese, men that are uh, not with type two diabetes. We don't know if this applies to women, but it, this is something that I'm sure is being studied because there probably is benefits. Now, it might depend on your goal. Maybe you're more likely to have fat loss doing a certain type of exercise in the morning, especially if it's without food, what we call fasted cardio. Maybe weightlifting and all is better in the afternoon. There's probably a lot of variables here, but I would say, I wouldn't worry about it that much, quite honestly. Figure out what works for you. Try working out in the morning. Try working out around lunchtime. Try working out after work at night. Figure out what works for you, what you like to do, and when you like to do it, you will be much, much more likely to go. All right, pregnancy. This is something that is a big deal, and I didn't realize how big of an issue this was in terms of pregnancies and complicated pregnancies, but I guess the mentality is still out there among a lot of obstetricians and a lot of family doctors delivering babies that, hey, if there's any complications or if there's any comorbidities medically, no, nope, you've got to just do bed rest or you can't exercise. And that may not be the best idea. So a group of researchers basically did a study, and I'm not sure where this was published, but they looked at a variety of different um, conditions that come about during pregnancy and looked at the data. They did these meta-analyses where they pool all these studies together, together to get a huge number of patients and then look to see whether or not exercise was good or bad. And generally, exercise is really, really good for pregnant women. 40% reduction in the risk of having major pregnancy complications like preeclampsia, gestational hypertension or just you know high blood pressure while you're pregnant, gestational diabetes or diabetes while you're pregnant, reduction in depressive symptoms among the moms, decreased odds of having a baby that's over nine pounds, and there was no increased risk of miscarriage, premature birth, or low birth weight baby in exercise. But what seems to be the case is you have some of these complications that I'll talk about in a minute and the, the doctors just say, oh, no, you can't exercise. Apparently 87% of physicians in North America still prescribe bed rest for high-risk pregnant women for a lack of a better therapeutic option. That comes from the study's lead author. So here are the, the only a few conditions during pregnancy that are thought that you shouldn't do regular exercise, okay? Severe respiratory disease, lung issues, things like that. Makes absolute sense. 
if you have heart disease, either you know acquired over the course of your life or congenital, some sort of condition, and you just literally can't tolerate the exercise, you don't have the cardiovascular fitness to do it. You have an arrhythmia, an abnormal heart rhythm that's not under control. Placental abruption, uncontrolled type one diabetes with really, really high blood sugar spikes, interuterine growth restriction where the baby is really, really uh, uh, abnormally small. You're in preterm labor now, severe preeclampsia. Those are about the only things. There are a whole lot of things that doctors seem to shut people down, shut pregnant women down from exercise that don't need to be, and this is what they found. You can exercise through all of these during your pregnancy. High blood pressure, either chronic or during just gestational uh, high blood pressure. If you're overweight or obese, there's no reason you shouldn't be exercising while you're pregnant. Uh, if you've had miscarriages in the past, that doesn't change the fact that exercise is fine and good for you. If you have twins, still exercise is not a complication. Epilepsy or a seizure disorder, you can still exercise. Anemia, low blood counts, still exercise. Uh, history of being extremely sedentary anyway. No, no, no. Even just because you're pregnant, you can get out there and exercise. Uh, and any orthopedic issues. If you've got back pain, if you know sciatica, if you've got knee problems, things like that, you can still exercise. I deal with this a lot and you might have to change the type of exercise you do to avoid aggravating whatever it is, but no, 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 no. The benefits of exercise during pregnancy are real. You definitely need to do it. If you've got any of those real, real concerning conditions, talk to your OBGYN. But my guess, if you have any of those, the respiratory disease or the preeclampsia, things like that, you're going to be managed not just by a general OBGYN, but it's going to be by a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And they probably know all the literature on exercise. So definitely look at that. And one of the things I mentioned in that was obesity, people who are overweight or obese. Let's talk about obesity a little bit and exercise. So obesity is not caused by just one thing. It's not just lack of exercise. It's not just poor nutrition. It's not any one thing. It's not just genetics. We hear all the time, I'm big boned. It's not any one of those things, but genetics does play a role. This is a true thing. There are clusters of genes in our DNA, these gene sequences that if you have them, that makes you more likely to be obese if you engage in unhealthy behaviors, poor nutrition, lack of exercise, than somebody that doesn't have those gene combinations. So there's this really interesting study in the journal Plus Genetics, and they looked at 18,000, more than 18,000 Chinese uh, was it men, uh, just Chinese adults. And what they found is that working out, exercising for 30 minutes, three times a week, just 30 minutes, three times a week, lowered the risk or lowered the incidence of obesity even among those who had those gene sequences. They were pre-genetically determined or, or predisposed genetically to become obese. So the exercise seemed to quote unquote thwart the obese genes. They had lower body mass index, less body fat, and slimmer hips than the ones that were genetically predisposed and who didn't exercise. What it's doing for some reason is it's influencing the expression of those obesity genes. And so if you exercise enough, it basically those don't manifest. If you just basically remain on the couch, then yeah, you're probably gonna get fat. Now they did find that jogging seemed to have the biggest effect, but that doesn't mean that that's the only type of exercise that will keep you from being obese. I would argue whatever you like to do, anything that keeps you active is gonna be good and lower your risk of obesity. Obviously, as we've talked about before, diet plays a huge role in it. Exercise alone will not help people lose weight. You have to get the diet part in there too, but it does seem to affect your risk of obesity genetically, which is really, really exciting. All right, low intensity. I talked about just doing anything to keep you moving. Well, what about cooking, vacuuming the carpets, uh, washing the dishes, doing laundry? Do any of those improve your health? And there was a study in BMJ, which is the British Medical Journal, and these researchers looked at this. It was from the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences. That would be a pretty cool place to study sports medicine. But uh, what they wanted to know is, does any of this, what they call low-intensity activity, lower your risk of premature death? And it's really interesting. So they took, it was a huge number of people. Let me see if I can find it here. 
Uh, well, all right, I can't. Oh, 36,000 uh, Norwegians. They had they tracked their movements with motion sensors, uh, accelerometers, and that kind of thing. And then they followed them for another six years to see which ones went on to die. And what they found out was really interesting. So they grouped people based once they got the activity and the motion data back into low intensity activities, moderate, you know, and all the way up to high. Well, it, it probably won't surprise you that people who got the most moderate to vigorous physical activity had the lowest risk of early death. That should surprise nobody. But even the people that just got low intensity activities, again, yard work and household chores, did see a benefit in their risk of early death. I mean, we just, anything counts. As long as you're not sitting on the couch or at a desk something all, all day long, cooking, cleaning, yard work, taking a walk, any of it, any of it can lower your risk of early death. The key here is that just sitting on your butt being sedentary is really, really bad. Um, it was interesting, they found out, and, and I'm gonna have to read this to you because it, it makes sense, the moderate to vigorous physical activity, that's gonna help build your cardiorespiratory fitness. The ability of your body to deliver oxygen to the muscles during periods of physical activity. Obviously, the better trained you are, the better your cardiorespiratory fitness, the more exercise you can tolerate. But these low intensity activities, whether it's walking, whether it's these household chores, did seem to improve glucose control and gestational diabetes. So if you're struggling being overweight or obese, maybe you have type two diabetes, just get in the house, get outside, and do any kind of physical activity, chores or what have you, and it could be very, very good for you. All right, last. Can you run, can I run a 10K with absolutely no training? It's interesting, so I ran from age 17, not counting running for travel soccer. I ran from age 17 until, I'd have to do the math, but it was basically, it was probably 10, 11 years and I ran pretty much every day. I actually really loved it. I loved the endorphins, it was a great stress relief in college and all that, and then, I got busy with orthopedic surgery training and residency, and I was in Memphis, Tennessee at the time, which was hot as can be, and I just grew to not like it. And that was also before, I'll date myself a little bit, but it was before the iPod, but certainly before the iPhone. So I'm just listening to myself think all day, and that in the heat especially, it was just brutal. So I quit running. I haven't run, other than run my sprint workouts that, that I, I do fairly often, or at least was, I've sort of cut that back during COVID, but I'm gonna get back into that too. Uh, but I haven't done running you know, in many, 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 many years. But I exercise pretty much every single day, five days a week of lifting weights, now cardio every day too, but even before that, cardio three days a week. I'm relatively confident I could get through a 10K. It might be miserable. I mean, that's 6.2 miles when I haven't run more than 200 yard sprints in a long time. But I feel like I could get through 55 to 60 minutes, which is probably what it would take out of shape, out of running shape to do it. But it's interesting, I'm not just saying this to just ramble on and on. I mean, ask yourself, could you do it? Well, there was this study that came out, it was an NYU scientist, he's an endurance specialist, Nico McCarty, that actually looked at this and, and studied it based on energy thresholds and looked at a lot of cases of human beings sort of pushing or exceeding their endurance thresholds and what he, the, the bottom line conclusion, I'm not gonna give you kind of all the specifics of the study, basically all humans he felt or he observed can run at least a 10K, six miles. Now I'm not 100% sure of that, but he's a, more of a specialist at this than me. Here's the thing, there's a lot of reasons that sort of limit your ability to perform past a certain endurance limit. Some of it's genetic, things like your lung function and lung size and your muscle uh, structure, whether it's fast twitch or slow twitch muscle fibers. Uh, but then there's also the issue of how you generate energy. Early in a run, you use the glycogen that's in your liver and a little bit in your muscles as a glucose source for energy. But very soon, you're gonna burn that off, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Then you switch to what's called anaerobic fitness or anaerobic oxidation, where you're having to uh, get 
you know, energy from muscle and from fat and it creates lactic acid. That's what burns in the muscles. The better shape you're in, the more, the longer maybe that it takes before you kick into anaerobic the, and the more efficient your body is at burning that fuel and you can tolerate lactic acid a little bit better. But the, the bottom line conclusion is not just that everybody can do it, but it gets to an issue of how well you'd be able to do a 10K without training. And again, don't take this as I'm recommending you go out and try this. There's a lot of orthopedic issues, stress fractures and shin splints and, and tendon and ligament things that can happen when you go from zero from forever to all of a sudden running six miles. It's possible, but it may not go so well. But basically what he found is your current level of fitness. So I'd be able to do that exercising every day or twice a day even though I don't run compared to somebody who does way less exercise normally, even though it's not running. So your level of fitness and what your background is anyway, athletically. So if you played soccer for years and years where you were running up and down the fields, you probably could run a 10K even though you haven't trained as a distance runner. So current level of fitness and athletic background play a role, but that ought to make you feel good that if you had to, you could run 6.2 miles. Again, I. I, I'll believe it when I see it. I'm not 100% sure uh, that uh, everybody could do that, but it is an interesting thought. All right, let me look at a couple comments here. Vikas in India, very, very cool. He talks about MCL injuries and how much time to recover. G generally, that's the ligament on the, hold on. That is the ligament on the inside of the knee. This is the side closest to the midline of the body. So this would be, it's backwards in the screen, but this would be, if I'm looking at it this way, right knee, because medial this side. Uh, that ligament heals without surgery. Depends on the severity of the injury. There is a small type of that that does need surgery, but that's pretty rare. Uh, that typically is anywhere from a week to six weeks. All right, I have to run. I really, really, really appreciate you being here. I, I, it means the world to me that you watch, that you send me notes about it. It's terrific. And if you're listening at home or in your car or at work by podcast, thank you for subscribing to the podcast. Those of you that haven't subscribed to the Better Than Ever Live podcast, definitely do so wherever you get your podcast. But subscribe on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Dr. David Geyer. Click the bell so that you're notified when I'm online. Follow my Facebook page, at Dr. David Geyer. And now I'm on LinkedIn Live every day. You can connect with me there as well. Thank you so much for joining, and I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday for Better Than Ever Live. Take